My name is Ryan Vandewerf. I'm a developer for the uh, OCI Grails team, and also work on Micronaut. Um, I originally made this talk for the purpose of trying to make people learn a little bit about the networking layer that a lot of people are deploying on in the cloud environment, right? How many people here are deploying their applications to like AWS or a cloud provider? So about half of you, right? So I think it's always good to understand at least one level kind of below where you normally work every day. So the reason why I made this talk is we'll talk about a little bit of that stuff and then we're gonna get into using Grails with AWS and different uh, tools that are available to help you get your job. And then if you stay towards the end, I'll show you some of the cool stuff in Micronaut that also helps with AWS. A little bit about me, I work on the Grails team. I've got two kids, uh, they're one teenager and one six-year-old. I uh, help run a local user group in Austin, Texas, is where I'm from. I've also helped do a Gradle implementation video series with a guy back there, Lee. And uh, I'm just sort of generally a hacker of things, uh, anything from cars to home automation, phones, gadgets, whatever. It's, I dig it. It's fun. Uh, I'm also into lots of DevOps and Linux stuff. Uh, I've done that at a previous job. Had to do a lot of the stuff every day. I also do a lot of Alexa, conversational AI, Google Home type of stuff as well. So if you have any questions about that later on, you can talk to me about that stuff too. So if you need any help with Groovy Grails or Micronaut stuff, uh, we can help. All right, so we're going to cover some VPC network basics. Uh, we're going to talk about how the S3 storage service works. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about Grails 3 plugins that will help you with uh, AWS stuff. I'm going to talk about some Gradle plugins that help you with AWS stuff. And then I'm going to also talk to you a little bit about some of the AWS capabilities that are in Micronaut and a couple of things that are coming in Micronaut that aren't there just yet. All right, so VPC, what is it? Virtual Private Cloud. So we want to make a proper architecture for this. So like normally, when Amazon first started, they didn't really have a private network concept or any of these things. You just had uh, what they call an EC2 classic now, right? Just a bunch of servers thrown out in the cloud, and it was up to you to come up with your own security measures to make them safe. Uh, so they weren't really isolated behind networks that were private or any of that kind of thing, which caused a lot of problems for traditionalists that wanted to put all their applications and their architecture out in, in the cloud. Um, so when VPC came along, that was kind of the answer to that, right? It's a whole software network that gives you private subnets and a NAT box and all these things to isolate and put your databases behind secure places and all of that. So I just want to talk a little bit about how we set that up as a sort of a basic proper architecture uh, to keep things kind of safe. And I'll talk a little bit about how routing works and how a NAT box helps you. Uh, got an ACL firewall, um, as far as the VPC firewall rules, how they, how they work. And I'll talk a little bit about some suggested subnets. And I'll touch on security groups and VPC flow logs. So if you need to do an audit of traffic coming into your system, you can be logging that data. I'll show you that. And uh, a thing called S3 endpoints uh, that helps your S3 access inside of your network go a lot faster. And touch on a little bit on VPC peering and some other miscellaneous tips here. So let me talk about some of the terms here. Uh, it sounds like some of you are familiar at least somewhat with AWS stuff, but I just want to cover the basics uh, for people that it's new to. So what is a region? A region is a geographic region that consists of a group of availability zones. Um, and what is an availability zone? That's a collection of data centers within 50 to 100 uh, miles of each other. And, and those all have fast network connections between each other, but the regions don't necessarily have fast connection. It could be across the internet or, or whatever, is usually the case with the Amazon. Some cloud providers actually have fat pipes between them, but uh, not so much on Amazon at this point. And then we talk about mo what is multi-AZ. So that just means your ability to spread your application across availability zones for kind of a high availability type of situation. Uh, and a subnet is just a group of IP addresses that are associated as a block. And a CIDR block is a, just a higher level block that many addresses and subnets are inside of it. All right, so what are some of the Amazon services here? We've got Route 53, Amazon's DNS service, uh, EC2. I always refer to that as EC2. It's Amazon's compute service. So those are your basic servers that you spin up that are virtual. Uh, S3 is Amazon's simple storage service. That's a basically op object storage. Uh, elastic Block Storage, or EBS. Um, it's kind of like a network-attached disk that you can attach to your instances. Uh, Lambda is, not, is uh, Amazon's serverless app system, not a Java Lambda. It's not a function type of thing. It's, uh, well, it kind of runs as a function, but it's a, it's a service. 
ELB means elastic load balancer. And then they also call ALBs. Those are the, sort of the second generation of them uh, for application load balancer. All right, so th this is what kind of the regions look like here. So we've got uh, them clustered around the world, uh, mostly in EU and US. And then we've got some in Asia, that more and more popping up all the time, and uh, South America and all that. So these are all, these re uh, yellow ones are regions, and then there's sort of edge locations as well for pushing things around. So here's what the availability zones kind of look like. Uh, you've got um, uh, US, U.S. West is a region, and they have 2A, 2B, and 2C. Those are availability zones. So those are groups of things in separate data centers. So if one of them is taken out by some cataclysmic thing, you, in theory, have t two more, or however many they have in each, each one here. So, you know, Ireland's got three there. And I think there's some new ones since I've updated this picture that are in Europe uh, and Asia as well. But uh, so everyone has at least two, right, as the minimum, so that there's some redundancy can be done. All right, so VPCs are something that's always done by default now because the EC2 Classic was just too, left people too vulnerable. Uh, basically, when you create an Amazon account and start wanting to create things, it's going to lead you through the wizard now to set up a VPC. And it costs nothing extra at all. So the only case where it can cost you something is when you have a NAT instance. And I'll show you that in a minute. It spins something up for you that's a box that you, they manage uh, on your behalf, but you're still paying for the compute time for that instance. All right, so let's talk a little about route, routing and subnets. So uh, here we've got a um, uh, starting subnet zero. By default, it'll create one subnet, and that's it. Uh, you can create a two subnet thing as part of the wizard, and it will create a, a subnet here where you can put more secure things. And then this is always going to go through your VPC router back to the gateway to the internet. When you create two uh, subnets like this, it's going to spin up a NAT instance for you, and that's a box that will be running and managing your traffic. So everything this guy wants to talk to the internet for, he's got to go through this one first. And so that gives you some security of this guy staying behind here. And then they've got, you know, on top of that, you can add, you know, different kinds of firewall type of services they offer now. So we can get a little fancier with it. Uh, it's, I find it best to have sort of three subnets here, one for your sort of DMZ, and then one for s secure stuff, and then a second one for things that are kind of in between that need to touch both things. So I find that, like front-end web services and things like that, uh, I find it better to put them all here and then just give the databases and data stores and things like that a little more security, uh, another layer behind that. So this, adding that third subnet really helps you out, keeps things organized. You want to set this stuff up right from the beginning, because unless you've got scripts that automate creation of your entire environment uh, you know, automatically, which you probably should have, but if you don't, uh, doing all of this stuff later after the fact, after your whole thing's set up at your company, it's very difficult to change it all around again. Um, so, they, so that's why knowing about these things, I think, is important and having at least some measure of planning or you may be partially involved in the process of setting things up uh, if your company may just be moving to Amazon or um, getting started there. Uh, by default, like things like S3 buckets you know, are not accessible to there. You've got to kind of poke some holes in things. And that's why uh, that second subnet where you put your front-end services in there, have more access to outside things, is generally a good idea. Because if all of the traffic is going through the NAT box, uh, it's going to get overloaded if you're pushing a lot of data through it. Um, one thing that can help with that is the S3 endpoints, because that'll give you an internal pointer to S3 that's not going through your NAT instance if you're pushing lots of data back and forth to S3. So we talk about redundancy here a little bit. So this is a multi-availability uh, zone. Uh, it's a little bit dense here on the screen, but uh, we've got you know things spread out across availability zones. So we have some redundancy across things, and maybe a load balancer that relegates that. Or you could just use simple Route 53 traffic uh, in some kind of round robin scheme. But having things spread out like this, this is if you want some sort of high availability situation, uh, you need to split things out like that. So you can create four subnets across two DMZs um, with two AZs and you know two secure subnets. Um, put all that stuff in there. And that's good stuff. Uh, you can use Route 53 health checks to check 
and have failover that way too instead of a load balancer. Uh, it's a little bit more inexpensive that way. You can also use VPC peering, uh, cross ability zones. So here's a little bit about the routing and the subnets. So we've got a subnet zero here and our router and a gateway. And so everything is going to be routed go outgoing on these things through your NAT instance by default. So uh, you may run into a situation where this box that's spun up by default is not hefty enough or doesn't have enough network I.O. Uh, you'll notice slowdowns or things like that uh, that need to happen. Uh, you, may need to, you can actually stop this instance and restart it as a larger uh, size if that's the case for you. And this is where you configure subnets. This is a part in the old console screen, but uh, it's more or less the same. Uh, we can create new subnets, uh, as many as you want. There's you know, really no limit. You can create new solder blocks. All that stuff really doesn't cost anything. The only thing that costs you is using um, IP addresses that are publicly accessible uh, if you are not using them. So if you allocate a bunch of IP addresses and don't allocate them to machines, they'll bill you for those, because IP4 addresses are you know, at a premium these days. And so when you create a subnet, you set up all the routes here. Uh, oops. So you can say, uh, you know, where do they want to go through? And what, uh, where, what's accessible to the internet? So you can route one subnet directly out to the internet if you want. Uh, another thing you need to do is set up security. So uh, you have ACLs, like a four follower wall here. Uh, and you can protect subnets instead of EC2 instances this way. Uh, this is kind of your you know, first level of protection. After that, you're going to get um, security groups. And you can just basically add these ACLs, and they're processed in the rule number. So you can pick a number for each rule, and that will just determine its precedence. And ACLs are stateless. So unlike security groups, um, you, know, you have to have an inbound and outbound rule for them if you want you know, full coverage. Uh, one thing that gives you people problems with Windows machines, especially, uh, you may have to accommodate various clients or OSs that use these ephemeral ports, um, but only open the ones that you absolutely need, uh, and make sure you block all these other ones, uh, because uh, that's usually where you, nefarious activity is happening. Security groups. So VPC security groups are a little bit different uh, than uh, the EC2 groups. Uh, I recommend using some kind of naming scheme to prefix them so you can keep tell them apart. Uh, if you call them all the same thing, uh, I've noticed developers will get confused and they'll edit the wrong ones. Like, oh, you meant change group five. Like, well, group five on, is in the VPC console is one security group, and then in the EC2 area, it's something else. Uh, there's some confusion. They could accidentally open up something to the internet that uh, you don't want. Uh, you can also use security group IDs and chain them together. So instead of hard coding IP addresses, that makes things a little easier to maintain. And again, these are also processed by rule number and all that. Uh, so what about auditing? This is something that had come up when I first moved a lot of stuff to Amazon was uh, clients wanted to know, how do I get logs for your firewall in case of an um, attack on your network or someone did break in and take things? Uh, it used to be, I don't know. <laughs> uh, call Amazon. But now they have VCBC flow logs, so you can monitor all your traffic coming in and out of your network. So if something uh, bad does happen, you can have a record of that. That's a checkbox a lot of uh, auditors look for when they're maybe reviewing your company uh, to become a customer, especially if you're in the financial sector or anything like that. It's becoming relevant almost anywhere now. And you can, uh, they're not free. Uh, you have to pay per gigabyte to ingest the logs or archive them. But just the ability to have that is good. And you can't log everything. You can't do DNS traffic or Windows license activation or DHCP types of things. Uh, I guess those are all security problems, potentially. Um, you could cheat Windows license activation if you knew what, the, what it was sending over the wire to uh, run Windows instances for free, I guess. I don't know. I don't know why anyone would want to. But. There you go. <laughs> you can also use tools like Sumo Logic or Elk and ingest all of these logs, right? Pull all that stuff into your main log aggregation center and do analysis on that or set alerts. So, you know, if certain th activity starts happening, you could send an alert if you're ingesting these logs into your uh, logging stack. 
So you can even make an IDS solution, right, that monitors all of this traffic and then responds in kind if there's some sort of attack or unusual activity. It could be then starting to change security groups and rules and subnet ACL blocking certain IP addresses from ever getting into your stuff. So you could make something fairly reactionary. And there's actually companies that have taken this and made products out of that to do just that, have that thing that used to be an appliance that you had to buy to put on a rack. It could be a piece of software that does all of the same things. All right, we'll talk a little bit about peering before we wrap up a lot of the network stuff here. Uh, there's just a way to link VPCs together. So if you have multiple availability zones, then maybe you have multiple, cust each customer has their own VPC or something like that. But maybe there's some common infrastructure that all of them need to run on that uh, you want to share. Maybe it's super expensive for a license of whatever piece of software you might have. Uh, you can link them together across availability zones. I don't think you can do it between regions unless they've added that recently. Um, and that way you can link accounts together too. So maybe you have an organization where VPCs for dev, VPC for QA, or different groups, um, you can link all those accounts together so that way, I don't know, if dev runs up a giant bill accidentally spinning up servers, uh, it can cause a problem. Yes? Okay, cool. So uh, even better, you can do it for everything now. I think you just have to keep in mind that there's not those fat pipes between regions, right? So between AZ is going to be very fast response time networking-wise, but you really wouldn't want to have uh, an availability zone in Ireland running your uh, front-end app and then putting the back-end app in, like, U.S. West or something. Uh, the latency between those two is going to be really great, so your application is going to be super laggy, right? So you, you want to keep those things uh, grouped together in AZs as much as you can, and then just kind of use the other way for smart routing or failover, depending on where the user is coming from. Uh, the only, another thing that get, can get you is uh, you've got to plan out your CIDR blocks correctly. So if everyone's using the same CIDR blocks, which is the, always defaults to the same thing in the wizard when you create a VPC, um, what will happen is uh, if those IP addresses overlap, you can't link them together because now it's, you know, they're, they're clashing with each other. So it's always a good practice when you create a new VPC to make sure you use a different CIDR block each time. So that way, if you do have to link them together later, you have that option. Otherwise, you're kind of um, out of luck. All right. All right, let's talk a little bit about S3 endpoints. Uh, they may have started adding these in by default because it used to be a thing that you had to do manually if you were working with S3. And almost everyone's running in a VPC now, right? So one problem that used to be a huge issue is if you're pushing a lot of files, maybe your application's using S3 directly, right? And it's putting things into buckets and pulling things out of buckets. Well, all the network traffic was having to go out through your NAT box back out to S3, which can overload your NAT box pretty quickly. So they added S3 endpoints in uh, your VPC console, and what that does is it basically gives you uh, the internal network, a tunnel directly to S3, so you're, you, you're not going through all of your other upper network layer to get there. And that makes a huge difference if you're doing large data, large files, videos, things like that. So just making a point to check to make sure that you have this uh, will make your access much better. It really is, it's just adding a line in there and enabling it, and that's all it is. So you can get fancy with it, add IAM policies and S3 policies and all those things. Um, it's a good freebie that a lot of people miss that I've noticed. Uh, we can use IAM roles here. So obviously, don't use the root account. I don't think they even let you anymore. Uh, if anyone's using the root account for anything ever, uh, you should have your hand slapped. Uh, everything should be using MFA authentication. I think you've heard enough stories of companies where someone had gotten in and deleted their whole infrastructure because they didn't pay a ransom and then went and deleted their backups because all their stuff was on Amazon. So they just got to the backups and deleted those too. There was, I think, a source code hosting service a couple years ago uh, this happened to, and they tried to get in and get access to their account back. Uh, they didn't have MFA turned on, and the hackers had destroyed their entire business, and it was gone. And it was people's source code they were hosting, too, so even worse. <laughs> no off-site backups, just kind of game over. Yeah. That would not only get you fired, but you could possibly be put in jail. I don't know. All right. Uh, a couple other tips about rebooting machines. Um, yeah. 
Uh, one thing that uh, a lot of people do is run their own VPN, ins open VPN instance on an EC2 instance instead of using Amazon's VPN service. Uh, you can save some money doing that because then you're not uh, tied with as many restrictions and you can have as many accounts as you would want at that point. Um, that's kind of a neat tip that I found is helpful. Um, elastic load balancers. So you can create internal elastic load balancers inside your VPC, which is super neat. So uh, not only would you have a front end being load balanced, or you can round robin it with uh, Route 53's DNS service, but you can also have that for internal things. And that really works for good for like a microservice type of situation where um, if you don't have a service uh, registry or service discovery type of f feature in your application, you can use these to kind of balance that for you and have a group of, say, whatever this microservice is, you've got 10 servers that service that one thing, uh, keep tabs on them and kill them and bring them back up if they die and make sure uh, auto-scaling works and all that stuff. So a couple of caveats. There's a, um, I've seen lift and shift people run into this. So if you take a really old, slow application and maybe some internal users thought it was fine to wait five minutes for a response, which sounds insane, but I've seen it. Uh, and if you're using these load balancers, they have a 3,600 second limit. So <laughs> you'll run into problems where it's waiting, running some big data query or something people are used to, and you moved it to Amazon, and they'll be like, I don't ever get a response, because it cuts off after that period of time at the load balancer is an upper limit. So keep that in mind. Uh, if you need anything fancy beyond that, there's something like tools like HA proxy that are more flexible, but very complicated to set up, can do a lot of that stuff for you. All right, always use EBS-based instances, uh, unless you know what you're doing. Uh, if you can spin up everything and recreate it with the drop of a quick script, uh, you, can, you don't have to rely on those. But uh, a lot of people use some sort of state to start and stop and do those kinds of things. Uh, and EBS-backed instances will always keep the ephemeral storage intact when you so stop and start them. All right. Talk a little bit about S3 storage and some of the limitations, because I think a lot of people use this as like a tool, but they don't understand how it works, and they get themselves into trouble with concepts like uh, eventual consistency, things like that. So uh, what, is that, what is that eventual consistency, right? So that means after you do an update or a create or a write of some sort, uh, and some other node immediately reads it, it may not be there yet, because it's a huge bank of servers. All this data has got to propagate across all of them. So if I go, we're to, you know, do something silly like run a database on S3 and then put a record into it. Um, and then I immediately read the record back, right? With via SQL, it'll be like table not found or whatever, record not found. I'm like, what do you mean? I just put it in, right? That's because it's not consistently there yet. So you have to have code that can retry. If you want to do crazy stuff like that, you got to retry until it's there because it will eventually be there. There's no guarantee of when, right? Could be a couple milliseconds to five minutes later, who knows? So yeah, making things retry and all of that. Uh, it used to be that US East had really slow consistency that there were almost no promises on. Uh, and they finally caught that up uh, through gains of technology to be consistent with the smaller regions, which kind of automatically didn't have that problem because they weren't as big. Uh, there are limitations with large files. So uh, anything over five gigs is uh, supported, but it doesn't, most tools don't handle them properly because it's basically MIME encoding the whole binary which blows it up, right? And then it's going to send it over the wire encrypted. So uh, pushing giant files around like that isn't, isn't very fun. Um, so if you want to find S3 tools that do that, make sure they support MIME and multi-part stuff. All right, let's talk about some, how do we do use S3 storage with the Grails um, S3? There's an AWS Gradle plugin um, you can use. Uh, it's kind of superseded all the other Grails 2 specific uh, S3 plugins. Uh, you don't really need a Grails plugin to do that anymore because everything's based off of a boot anyway, and Gradle's the build tool. So uh, we've got one here. It's a Gradle plugin uh, you can use. Uh, so if you're using Grails 3 apps, it's pretty simple. Uh, I'll show you that here quick.
All right, there we go. So all this is is really simple here. Uh, we've got a basic plugin here, and we just put S3 brackets around it, what bucket we're using, uh, what profile we're using. It's going to use the credentials file in your home directory, so it'll be under your home directory, .aws, and then it'll look in a file called credentials. Uh, and at that point, you can uh, tell it what files you want to upload. Uh, here's just a simple example of pushing something. Uh, and then you can download things and save them to certain places. So uh, if I go into my Gradle tasks right here, other I've got an S3 upload and S3 download. So if I just want to upload a file, throws it in that bucket, there's the downloadable link. I can just grab it later. And same thing with downloading. It's just an easy thing you can do with scripting um, in, as part of uh, your sort of build process to use uh, S3. All right, we've got some more general uh, Grails plugins. Um, there's a few ones to avoid that you might find lurking out there on the plugin portal. Uh, there's one called Grails AWS plugin. Avoid that, it doesn't work. Uh, it's, it looks like it's almost there, but it's not f actually complete and doesn't work. Um, you want the AWS SDK plugin, which I think there's somebody here that works for the company that maintains that. <laughs> Vladimir over there, Agora Pulse, puts a lot of work into the cool Grails AWS plugins. So I'm going to talk quite a bit about those. So if I'm making mistakes or I'm lying, call me out. Or mistaken. You've also got one called Carmen plugin. Uh, Dave Estes, the guy that makes the Asset Pipeline plugin, makes one called Carmen. It's sort of a cloud uh, library plugin that supports Amazon and a couple other providers. And that's just a way of, uh, if you want to be able to push files to cloud file systems but not make something provider specific, you can use his plugin to be able to push things uh, there. So, general use of it, I'm going to just gloss over it here real quick. It supports things like AWS, OpenStack. Rackspace, which is technically OpenStack, I guess. Azure, and uh, maybe he's added some since then. But uh, there's the link for it. Uh, there's where you go figure out how to use it. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. I just want to make people aware of it, because a lot of people don't know about it. And it can also, if you're not using it for cloud, but you may plan to, it actually has a local storage provider thing built in. So you code everything the same way, and then it's just a matter of changing config files, whether it's running locally or on some other cloud provider. It's kind of neat. So this is basically all you have to do to configure it to work. And then it's got a service you use, and you can get and put the files. All right, the AWS SDK plugin. This has traditionally been a wrapper for the AWS Java SDK, but it gives us some extra benefits. Uh, it's got some extra services around certain items that it can provide extra value for uh, that really help you out. And then uh, pretty much as a general rule, I've noticed that if the pl plugin doesn't do what you need exactly, they keep an instance of the underlying Java stuff there that you can get to from their services. Uh, so you can uh, get something deeper, especially when it's something like DynamoDB or something like that. This is, this is really the plugin for Grails 3 that you're going to use. That's going to do more than anything else. So, uh, you know, and if you want a service that isn't supported by this plugin, you can use, use any of the Java libraries directly. So a lot of these things don't necessarily need a Grails plugin because they're not really providing extra, extra value above uh, the Java stuff. And there used to be a point in time where everyone was writing plugins that just simply wrapped a Java library. And we've generally just stopped approving those on the Grails plugin portal because usually they uh, don't do anything. If it doesn't provide any extra value, there's no reason for someone to start depending on it because then you're probably going to forget about it in two months and then someone will be stuck using it and not know why you know, it's broken. So it's just generally just use the Java libraries directly in that case. So I think it's been pared down to more limited services than it used to do. But it's, again, it's for those things that it adds uh, extra value to. So what are the things that were supported? Uh, I may have added some of these recently, but DynamoDB is one, S3, Kinesis, uh, Simple Email Service, uh, Simple Notification Service, SQS. Uh, those are the main ones. Are there other ones that have been added? Is this pretty much the same? Security? Yeah, there may have been some in the last several months that have been added, but those are the, a lot of the main ones. I've got a little demo of a lot of this stuff here. Uh, so DynamoDB, uh, is it, who's here has heard of DynamoDB? It's like a really old Amazon thing, right? So it's just a really quick way to use a 
key store database that's very pretty inexpensive. Um, and you can use this thing called DynamoDB Mapper. There isn't a GORM implementation for it. Um, there was once one, once upon a time, someone made an attempt to have one, but uh, it fell out of maintenance and hasn't been updated. But you, they, this uh, plugin comes with something called DynamoDB Mapper that's pretty handy. It'll let you do some basic CRUD kind of operations with DynamoDB that makes it a lot easier to deal with. So you can use annotations on it, like DynamoDB table to describe attributes, uh, DynamoDB attributes. Uh, here's a link to the uh, GitHub and examples, and I have an uh, example application here. I'll show you. It'll make it a little bit easier to see. All right, so I can fire up this app. Fire it up. So what we've got here is um, I made something called, uh, it takes a quiz item. So this is something that we've taken from our Alexa stuff. We have a database of quiz items, and you can ask Alexa to, like, what's your favorite color? And there's a list of choices for it. So uh, Lee back there had made a thing called Hero Quiz for the Alexa. And basically, this is just an application that uses the same DynamoDB database, but we can mess around with it with this plugin. Um, and so we've got basically an index, a list, a show. We can, you know, traditional thing, objects about it. Uh, one thing that's kind of a, a bit of a buzzkill is that you can do these traditional functions in um, Grails, but you can't use the fields plugin because these are POJO objects, not domain objects, and the fields plugin only works with dom proper domain objects. So you have to get a little bit of creative here in the uh, view layer. So I've got one here. So I've got a create page, and it's a little bit messier because I have to actually you know, get a reference to the actual object, and I can't use the fields plugin to iterate, so I've got to do that myself. Um, and all of, I'm going to share all this code here so you can get to it later. So when we pull this up, we've, okay, we've got this thing fired up. So all that's really happening is uh, if we go into our services, All we have to do to use this plugin for DynamoDB is basically extend this abstract DB service and then give it what POJO is, what object is going to be returned out of that as a row of data. So uh, that's all you have to do is extend that and tell it, uh, again, what class it's using for it, and then you're kind of ready to go. You can just use it inside of a controller here, which is what I've got here. And so we can get things like you know create a table if it's not there, go ahead and do a query out of the uh, database, and give me results. I can you know, list things out or show an item so I can just get it by its key. So they use hash keys instead of IDs um, to look at them. All right, so now I can actually look at this guy. And I can go in here to quiz item controller. So I've got, here's my Dynamo database. These are all my items in it. Uh, the keys are these hash codes. So I've just added, um, one here, you know, I love great conf. How do I get more? You can attend. I can watch things on Twitter about it. I can watch videos later or ask my friends about it. Um, and I can also make a new item here and say, what's the question, you know? This is when we do, what is your favorite? Uh, programming language. This is what we do in the Alexa workshop. And then you give it the number of which one of these is the correct answer. So we'll just say two. You know, Kotlin, Groovy, Java. How about Tickle? Oh, okay. So answer two is the correct one, right? Groovy. So. And then we can go back, and now we can find that in the list, and we're just pulling all this stuff out like we do a regular CRUD Grails app, but we're using 
just this AWS plugin for DynamoDB. That's pretty fun. All right, so what else can we do? We can do things with S3 also. Uh, they've got a uh, service for that. You can manage buckets, upload and download and delete files. Uh, you can use this as a kind of a cr quick CRUD browser. If you want to give someone limited access to an S3 bucket maybe, uh, you could have a little application that fronts that using this plugin uh, to list all those things out. And that's the same, uh, I have that all in the same application here. So I've got a thing called bucket controller. And he's getting a list of all the buckets that I have in our account, and so I can find great comp for you. I've got, I can browse things in it. I can download this picture. I'll grab it. Uh, I can delete things. I can delete the buckets. I can do all this stuff. I can upload a new thing. So I can upload a new file. So now when I go back here and go to this bucket, I had the stuff there. Oh, I already uploaded the same file twice. Oh, well. Anyway, that's how big the file is. So that's kind of neat, too. We've got S3. Um, so another thing you can do that's kind of cool is you can tie in things like Lambda functions in uh, using Groovy. And I can make my own. So here I've got a uh, Lazy Bones template that just generates Groovy Lambdas. And I've got, I made one here. I've got a series of them to show different Amazon services. So I've got one for S3, and all I need to do is upload this to Amazon uh, via the Gradle uh, AWS plugin. And so I can just upload this, and what's gonna happen is it's just gonna call this Lambda when I upload something new to the uh, function. And the way I can verify that that happened was, here, I'm gonna print this message in the log. So if I go to CloudWatch and I did something, I can find that in there. I have that here. So I just uploaded a file, and it's going to tell me here. Um, no, that's not the right one. Oop, I got a bug. But normally here, it'll show the message and go on your happy way. Uh, here's one. Here's an older one. And it'll basically just say, received message. Here we go. I got something. So you can make that Lambda do whatever. So if someone uploads something in an S3 bucket, you can say, oh, you know, take some action. Send an email, alert somebody. Or if someone deleted something, right, that's a, that's a maybe someone accidentally remove something important from S3. You can have a Lambda kick off or a notification cut kick off with SNS and tell someone about it, right? Maybe they weren't supposed to be touching that and it's kind of an honor system you've got going on. Uh, we've got uh, Kinesis support is also supported inside of the AWS plugin. Um, we can, uh, if you're not familiar with what Kinesis is, how many people have heard of uh, Kafka? All right, a few hands. Uh, Kafka is like a message streaming thing, so it's kind of the evolution of like a, a, a JMSQ or RabbitQ kind of streaming thing of messages. Um, it's, it's all, everything is dealt with in streams, and what's cool about these kinds of things are when things come in as a stream from somewhere, I can tee it off to multiple applications, and none of the applications know anything about the, the data has been duplicated. So I can 
you know, have one stream going to a data warehouse, one stream going to your application, and nothing is slowed down in the process. That's what's cool about things like that. Kinesis is their version of the open source Kafka library, and they're basically offering that to you as a service. And what's cool is you can link in lambdas and things like that, so when the Kinesis message happens, uh, I can link that to something and make something happen. Call a Lambda and then do something, right? So I can batch process things on Amazon by sticking things in a Kinesis stream. Maybe your application does something and it was like, okay, process that later in a queue somewhere, right? So instead of doing things that we used to do with like quartz running on a scheduled basis, right? And it would pull and then get some data and then run it. We can use something like uh, the Kinesis Lambda and say, okay, wait for some message to happen in the stream and then it's gonna trigger this Lambda. It's gonna do the processing whenever it can, finish things up and then um, move on. And you're, again, your application just fired that off and it's not waiting for any response. It's just uh, handled how it is. And then you got a data warehouse team, right? They can tee off all of these same things as well. Um, and put that data in a separate data warehouse, right? And then you don't have to worry about your application replicating or any of that kind of stuff. Everything's uh, transparent. So uh, this plugin provides a thing called Amazon Kinesis Service as the main artifact. Uh, and it gives you abstract utility classes to consume streams, um, which get, makes it nice for tight integration with Lambda. So let me show you that. So I've got here a Kinesis uh, handler class. So this is a groovy um, thing. And what's different is that you have to implement this thing called a request handler with a Kinesis event. And this is what populates all of the data. So when your Lambda gets called, everything that it needs to know about why it was called and who called it are in this Kinesis event here. And then we can go ahead and just process something and print things to a log and just say what it is, right? So I can go into here in my Grails app, I've got a Kinesis demo service. And I can insert something into Kinesis. So I just have a thing here that says send into Kinesis. It's a map of stuff. Uh, you can create a record and then put it in there. And all the service here from the plugins providing all this for you automatically injected. So I can just go ahead and add the records in. Uh, and it'll kick off that Lambda process uh, after the fact. And then to you know, show something like that runs, I can go in here, fire it off. So I sent a message into the Kinesis queue. Now let's go find it. So here we go, Kinesis Lambda says, uh, consumer invoked. Here's our data here. So we've got our payload we just sent it. it says, hey there, Copenhagen. Groovy's awesome, all that fun stuff. What else can we do? We can do simple email service. So they have an actual email service that will fire things off. Uh, that's kind of neat because uh, you can use other mail services, but you have to rely on your score that you get for mail to uh, how credible your emails are to be delivered to the recipients. So this kind of helps you out with that, but they have really strict controls. So if you want to send out more than 1,000 emails a day or things like that, you need to get quota improvements. So you can't use them to spam people and lower their scores. So. <laughs> They're starting to crack down. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Good to know. So they have a little email template here. So what's kind of neat about this plugin is you can use a template, right, to render. So I can make a, a GSP page or something and then render that template as an email automatically. Um, I think one of the email plugins kind of does that too. Let me show you that.
Uh, oh wait, no, I don't have an example of that one. But um, basically, it's just a GSP page. You can render it and call that as part of the plus process. That's the extra value the plugin gives you above just using the Amazon API directly, right? So as I say, they whenever there's value to be added, they'll you can add it. There's docs there. SQS it supports simple queue service. That's just a basic queue. Um, I find um, because SQS doesn't work with Lambda triggers, five minutes, right. then uh, you know. I find that Kinesis works much better because SQS doesn't do that. All right, SNS is just a simple notification service, all that fun stuff. All right, last five minutes, let's skip over into some Micronaut stuff. All right, so how does AWS, uh, Micronaut help you with AWS? Um, we have auto discovery uh, of AWS instance metadata. So what this means is when the application fires up in Micronaut, whether it's a client or a server, we're going to figure out uh, whether you're on Google or Amazon and then automatically find all the metadata through their metadata services for you and populate that into the server configuration uh, data, all the met metadata available there. So when you uh, get a bean to the server, for example, when you're running a server mode in Micronaut, you've got a class here called... Um, creates this class called uh, EC2 Instance Metadata. And so what happens here is uh, we're caching all this information about the instance, right? So d what availability zone you're in, region, accounts, what image ID is running, all the IP addresses on that instance, at least the major ones for private and public, and how to access localhost. So you have all this stuff available to you when an instance starts up. So if you're running, right, right now, it only supports AWS and Google, but um, there's, uh, that part will be there for you automatically, right? And it's abstracted through this thing called, um, you know, metadata configuration, which you can include. So you can actually say, I want a configuration for this Amazon stuff and I would get to it. You just add this requires environment EC2. So we'll set that environment automatically for you if we detect uh, your servers running on one of those two services. And we've got the same thing here for Google Compute. We've got a Google Compute instance metadata uh, which is backed by a generic interface. And you can get all the network interfaces and all the different information available to you there. So that's one way that Micronaut helps you. Um, another way is we do support lambdas uh, natively. So uh, we have a uh, groovy functions and Java functions thing here. So uh, for example, we can, uh, if you look in the Micronaut examples repository under the pet store, we've got a lambda uh, tweet function that's using Groovy functions. Uh, I've got one that I'm working on right now, Alexa support for it as well. Um, and the Groovy stuff needs more work, but that's coming as well. And then one more thing we're going to add uh, for AWS services going forward is adding support to the Groovy functions for Kinesis and SNS and SQS, because all those lambdas have different signatures, right, and different data that comes in. So we're going to add specific support, just like Alexa functions, for all of those other things as well. Another thing that's coming that's not done yet, and this may change, this is code in progress here, but um, we've got uh, Route 53 support. So we have um, uh, we have an auto naming client. So basically what happens is uh, you can use the Route 53 service discovery service, register your instances on uh, Amazon through the, if you're hosting a DNS name. So you have to be hosting a DNS name through Route 53. You can use their services to register your instances underneath the service. And that way you don't have to use console or Eureka or any of those other things. You can just use the built-in stuff to Amazon. And it'll automatically kill off uh, instances when, they're, when they die off or when they become unhealthy uh, as well. You know, all those things that kind of console does for you automatically. It's just you can do this built-in Amazon and you won't need any other things to run. So uh, that's pretty nice. Um, and all you have to do to get that to work is add a property called ser service discovery enabled. Again, this code is in progress, so it may change a bit uh, before it's released. It is out there as a pull request right now, but it's, we're still working on it. Uh, another thing we're, we're adding here is uh, parameter store support. So uh, console has a concept of shared configuration, right? Your application 
uh, can have configuration data that's spread across all your nodes, right? So they could get maybe a common database password or something like that, right? Well, AWS has a concept th service called, it's under the system service called Parameter Store, and it does basically the same thing. So we have support coming for that as well, and what it does is it works just like console, except for um, we can tell it um, whether system properties are application-wide or instance-specific, and we can go and add all those automatically. So when you go and get a, connect to a node and it's using Parameter Store and you've turned that feature on, it'll make sure those nodes have all that data available to it from its configuration to get maybe a common database password or uh, secure parameters is something this thing supports, so it'll actually encrypt all the parameters being sent to it. Um, that's something else you can do with it. So if you want to be really native with AWS, all these things uh, coming soon will uh, help you out there quite a bit. And then we're also going to be adding other stuff, um, you know, specific to other cloud providers too, right? We kind of Amazon here at first, but Azure is another one we're going to be doing stuff for. They actually have uh, functions that support Java. Uh, Google doesn't, so we can't really do much with functions there. Um, but they also have the same concept that we're going to be adding support for, as well as a uh, through their metadata service. So uh, those are all coming soon. And I think that's about it. I think I'm out of time anyway. So here's some helpful classes uh, if you want to look around at how that stuff works. AWS Client Configuration, AWS Configuration, Environment, AWS Credentials Provider, uh, something so it'll manage the credentials. Instantiate credentials and all that stuff yourself. All of that, you just use the uh, credentials provider configuration and it will automatically So all that's handled, you know, like how you do it in Grails, right? And we went through all that, and that. Went through that. All right, I've just got links here uh, of all the stuff. I'll share the slides with everybody. It's got all the good stuff there. All right, so uh, thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Does anyone have any questions?